Brother Anna, or you, you're ready? Okay, it looks like we've got just about everybody here to get ourselves started today. So let me uh, bid you uh, good morning and, and welcome to uh, Ashford Memorial Methodist Church in our seventh outdoor service now. And so we're still operating under the uh, direction of the, our COVID-19 reopening committee. And uh, so we're able to do these services. And we hope you brought along a mask, at least for your singing, uh, and then maintain our six foot social distancing. And there's about 20 feet or more between those flags. So families that cluster around the flags are gonna be in good shape. Uh, let's see, Anne did tell me that uh, she has upper room uh, magazines, both the regular and the large print are on the trunk of her car. So on your way out, you can uh, take hold of those. Uh, big thanks to, sorry about that wind, but big thanks to uh, Dan Elder and the Oconee Well Drillers for letting us meet out here in their, their beautiful backyard with all this grass and greenery. Uh, big thanks to, to Ann, as always, for pulling together our music and sending out our order of service, and to Quinn for compiling our prayer list each week. Laura Nain is our video tech for streaming today. And uh, I know that we've, we've developed a little following of folks there as well. And, and thank you, Tyler, for pushing that over into YouTube because uh, some folks that aren't on Facebook, that's where we get to, uh, to see it and pass it along to others. Well, let us begin with our invocational prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather in spirit and in truth to offer worship to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this first day of the week. We feel that, that spiritual uh, power, that draw, that uh, almost like a centrifugal force. We, we want to assemble as the body of Christ. And here we are and uh, opening our service of worship to the Watkinsville and Oconee County uh, community. And so we, we pray, Lord, for thanks and give you thanks for the beautiful morning. And we would ask that you be present by your Holy Spirit, inspiring us and helping us and uplifting us with your joy, hope, faith, and love. All of this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would uh, reach for your opening hymn, either your phone or the copy that you printed off to bring along with you, and this is, my faith looks up to thee. So let us be standing as we sing verses one and two. Let us uh, join together in reciting our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, 
he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And if you would continue to stand as we have the reading of our scripture lesson for the day, when we meet in our sanctuary, we traditionally remain standing for the reading, not only of the gospel account, but those for uh, anywhere in the scripture. So let us hear this scripture from Luke's gospel, the 18th chapter. This will be the, uh, the first eight verses of Luke's gospel, beginning verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. <coughs> For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we prepare our hearts for prayer, let me make an addition to our uh, prayer list. Hopefully you were able to print this off or you have it on your phone so that throughout the week as you have your personal devotion time, you can consult it. Uh, we want to add uh, the name of Margaret Ward. This is Jake Williams' uh, grandmother. She passed away on Thursday. And so we want to uh, add, add her family, Jake and the rest of them, uh, to our list. And now let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we hear these very words of Jesus' teachings to his uh, first disciples in this short story. Never give up on our prayers. Help us, gracious God, to glorify your name as we are encouraged to trust you that you are more willing to hear than we are to pray. For we want to be found faithful in that duty, to pray and to praise your holy name. And so we begin with our list of requests. And so we, we include our sympathies for the family of Margaret Ward, the passing of this faithful saint. And also for all of those who are suffering any kind of illness, especially those with the coronavirus, virus. many others are, are suffering from harder to diagnose ailments, you know, from loneliness or anxiety, or being so isolated. And, and so help us, gracious God, to be able to reach out in <coughs> compassion in various, in various ways and means to make contact with, our, uh, with the rest of our Ashford friends and members. Grant us wisdom in the days ahead. 
courage that we can make right choices, especially when it comes to this process of selecting our leaders for the local government and for state and certainly for national offices. We pray for your guidance and your compassion for all. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen, and thank you, Anne, for finding that wonderful recording of our choir. And uh, so we look forward to the opportunity to be back in our sanctuary again where the choir can sing. And, 
and we can hear you in person. Well, we're going to finish up that series that I started two or three months ago, What Every Christian Should Know About, and today it's about parables, and that will be the transition, you see, for us to move on into the next uh, five or six weeks, which will be about parables. And so today is that point where we, we want to look into these pithy stories that Jesus is so known for. These are ingenious word pictures that... Um, well, they're compact spiritual lessons. Take uh, Matthew 13, verse 33, just that verse where Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. Now, that was, in the original Greek, just 19 words. And he told the whole story there. And it is about, like most of his parables, the most common of activities and it's told in the fewest number of words. Jesus, the master storyteller, his narratives epitomize, well, the plain, but the powerful, and also the profound. And he does it so easily that we can recognize and remember these, these messages and these teachings because of those compact stories. That's going to be the the focus of my messages for the next many weeks, and uh, today we, we begin with a parable that comes near the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, really about the end of his, his uh, messages through parables, our lesson for today, Luke 18, those first eight verses. We often refer to this, kind of the shorthand, that this is the parable of the persistent widow, all those depending on how you're looking at it, sometimes it's known as the parable of the unjust judge. But it is a parable where Jesus said uh, to his disciples to show them that they should always pray and never give up. This is the declaration of that first verse. Every one of his parables has a context as well as a meaning, and we have to take those together. And so the context or this particular parable begins uh, in the latter part of Luke chapter 17, verse 22, where he's speaking to his closest disciples, and uh, uh, he's talking to them in that 17th chapter about the end times. So the context here is a, a discourse about the second coming. What will it be like the day that the Son of Man is revealed? He says, well, it'll be like just as in the days of Noah in the flood. And, and, uh, and the same at days of Lot and Sodom. And so it'll be these days when uh, evil and death and destruction are occurring. This must have been on his mind as he left Galilee for the last time. He was on his way to Jerusalem for his last week. And so Luke 17 and Luke 18 occur just before he enters Jericho. And so he is, in this context, identifying the kind of challenges that go with the end times, the evil and the calamities that must be faced as we enter the end times. And that's why he's saying we'll need to remain in prayer, persistent prayer, in order to survive the time. You see, the second challenge here is especially pertinent for all of us because uh, there's been 2,000 years of waiting that have transpired and the Lord has not yet come. So to remain persistent in prayer in the face of such a long wait, well, a wait for the judgment of God's justice, that's making it a pretty tough time. And it makes the first challenge even more difficult because of that weight, because there have been evil times all along. Death and destruction have been prominent in every century and in every country for two millennia. So I'm beginning our look at the parables by starting at the end of Jesus's teachings on parables, because that's where we are. 
we are still in that same context, like the widow and the judge, the characters of his story. But the good news, of course, is that we, well, we are not to despair. We are not to, no matter how bleak things are, lose heart, but continue to pray. Even though the world is doomworthy and continues to barrel toward judgment day, we, the Christians, the people of God, are the ones that are called upon to continue to pray, to continue in persistent prayer with confidence that God will hear and answer his people. The Holy Spirit may move it to being a really short sermon here if I can't hang on to these notes. Yes, we hear his answer in the times of Noah, that kind of evil, a time that requires urgent and persistent prayer. Every century has had its catastrophe. We happen to be experiencing one for the 21st century right now with the coronavirus. But the whole scenario is all too familiar because there's always been injustices that have resulted in protests and or riots and other things that cause the nations to be insecure and anxious. And so the scenario is all too familiar. He begins this parable with, uh, in a certain town. Now that's Bible speak or anywhere, everywhere. It just means anywhere there is a judge who does not fear God nor care what people think. A judge who encounters a widow. The widow is the symbol of all who are in need and, and without resources, no allies uh, to represent them. See, this woman doesn't even have a male heir of any kind or she wouldn't be in court by herself. Even a junior cousin from some that was male could do this. But no, she has none. Now, of course, in the judge's instance, action should be quick because a widow in that condition normally is just shown mercy and she's granted whatever it is that she needs, but not this guy, not this guy. In Jesus' time, there were three types of judges. The ones we're most familiar with are the ones that were called the Sanhedrin. They were kind of like the Supreme Court of of the nation. These were the that year's leaders. They were going to sit in court in Jerusalem. And they were, well, they were strongly influenced by the doctrines of the Pharisees and the politics of the Sadducees. Um, and we know how that came out. They're the ones that decided Jesus needed to be crucified. So you get some idea of, of the quality of, of judge that they had. Now, some of the large cities had their own cadre of judges. There was usually 23 of those that made up the court. There were 71 on the Sanhedrin. They could decide local matters. But then there, the third judge was probably the one that was more prominent in the sense that there was more of them. And these were judges that had been appointed by Rome. And in fact, that was their job, was to, uh, to look out for Caesar's interests in the countryside, in the small villages. These judges were notorious for their lack of morals and scruples. They were interested in bribes. Now, part of the reason that the, 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 the Jews were so upset with them was they didn't abide by Jewish law, Jewish culture. Uh, and so bribes were the, were the normal means of the justice system in those days. And so this is probably the kind of Jew, these guys were Gentiles, they weren't Jewish at all. So if you want a definition of a, a secular judge in those days, this guy is the one, and he's probably the one that, this is the type of judge that Jesus has focused on for this parable. Definitely amoral and, and wicked by religious standards. But this unjust judge could actually see the practical side that he faced. This situation was, well, he knew the, this type of person that she had a particular kind of case that uh, he was just going to be subjected to her 
and her cause uh, unless he does some, did something about it. He didn't want to become weary, he says, or, or get a headache. So he reached a turning point, finally, after several attempts by this widow. And that's what happens in Jesus' parables. We reach a turning point. In his case, he, he thinks it is better to give her justice than to put up with her persistent nagging. Now, different turning points in different parables. You know, the, the prodigal son, he came to himself. What? He was eating pig, eating uh, corn cobs with the pigs and decided, ah, I can be a slave to dad and do better than this. And so that was when the tipping point was reached there. Well, this judge had reached that tipping point, which gives us the meaning most parables right there we can find the meaning now certainly the meaning in this case is the judge does not represent God we can't get too bored in on that God is being represented by one of the characters there other than to say that in this parable God is contrasted to the judge that God God is the one who is faithful and stays with God's law and wills. And uh, so Jesus, in his parables, is teaching us positive lessons about God. That's what he's trying to get the Jewish people to understand. This is the way God acts in these situations. This is what you need to remember. And as he lifts those things up, they recognize from the scripture that this is how God, Yahweh, father would respond and Jesus asks him then he gives him a test it's a what we call rhetorical question test they don't have to answer but he knows the answers are going to pop right into their head without any trouble at all and so this is what he says listen to what the unjust judge says and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night yes well maybe they didn't say yes and cheer him on but that's what was on their minds. Will he keep the, uh, putting them off? No. They know that about God. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Yay. However, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Silent. Oh, Maybe, don't know, hope so. Will he find faith on the earth? That rhetorical question echoes down through the 20 centuries right there into our minds. Will he find faith on the earth? Yes, no, yay, silence. What must be going on in the mind of that widow, in the mind of that widow? Vindicate me. That's what she wants. At least have mercy on me. That's the minimum. Any judge could do that with no trouble just because she's there by herself. Let's just have mercy on her. She gets her case. It still would have been a long time span. I mean, for her. The final vindication would come at what seemed like an eon in her life, having suffered the injustice. But we can even look to the Apostle John. Now, if you recall in his gospel account, uh, John believed that Jesus would return during his lifetime. And so that would seem an interminable amount of time, a lifetime, especially for John. Of course, it's Peter that is given the revelation. Peter learns in 2 Peter, we know from his letter, that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years for us. That's his point. It's only two days for God to wait. But it seems like 2,000 years for us. Particularly when Christians are under persecution. They live in a hostile environment. They did then, and that has not changed in 2,000 years. Routinely, Christians are still maligned and persecuted, ridiculed, censored. And I'm not talking about Islamic countries or communist nations, no. That's in you know, advanced Western countries, whether it's Europe or even in the United States. It still goes on. 
So Jesus' admonition to pray and not lose heart is still the encouraging words we need to listen for and look for and find spiritual strength in what Jesus has to say. Now recall that Jesus began his ministry, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15, repent and believe the gospel. That's how he started. That's it. Repent and believe. Act in faith. Believe the gospel. Because that's success in the kingdom of heaven. When we act in faith. Faithfully. Repent and believe. You know, historically, God has been able to use the most wicked behavior of the most unrighteous people to accomplish his will, to advance the story of salvation. God has done that throughout the Bible. I mean, all we have to do is look at Nebuchadnezzar if you talk about a pagan. Yet God sent him to be the judgment of Israel for their sin. And they were taken off of Babylon. Slavery. And then yet God used another pagan, Cyrus, to defeat Babylon. And this Persian king was the one that released them to go back to their promised land. And so it is throughout the Old Testament. And even in Jesus' other parables, we can think of some of those, can't we? There's one parable where, where he says there's an unrighteous but shrewd steward. You know, he's the one that controlled the books for the boss, for his master. And he, he did some creative bookkeeping in favor of some of the boss's clients, or at any rate. And, and he was commended for it in Jesus' parable. Why? The wicked person's actions do not defeat God because this is where God brings good out of bad. He depicts something even done by wicked people as good and as right and with proper outcome. God is not defeated by failures. No. This hypothetical judge does the right thing but for the wrong reason. Not because she deserved justice. It's just that he could, he could see a way out. The wrong way, but he got the right result. You see, it's meant to reveal God's character, God's plan, God's timetable that's at work in a fallen world. God has fallen people to work with, so God is able to use fallen people to arrive at the general good. We call that God's will, when the good gets done. And the widows persist in prayer. You see, Christians are today's widows. In this world, we are the widows of that peril. We need to be about persistent prayer. That's what's been authorized by parables like this that we are to not lose heart with the prayer. Now I want to close with one more parable. This will take a minute or two. But it's another parable that's recorded by Luke, and it's in the 11th chapter. We go back to that, 11 verses 5 through 8. And the reason I want to conclude with this, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that here Jesus makes it personal to each and every person in that crowd and to us today. He not only makes it personal, but the context is, is very special as well. He says, suppose one of you had a friend, and you shall go to him at midnight and say to him, lend me three loaves. I have a, a friend of mine on a journey, and I have nothing to feed him. And the voice from inside the home says, don't bother me. We're all in bed. I can't come and give you anything. Jesus goes on in his parable. I say to you, he will not give up, get up and give him anything because he is a friend. But if he is persistent, he will give him all he needs. It's another one of those right things for the wrong reason. In Jesus' parable, we know that is the parable of the friend at midnight. And the context is very important for me because he gives this parable at the conclusion in, in, in Luke's account, 
at the conclusion of having taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, the very Lord's Prayer. At the end of it, he says, here's a parable that explains what we're talking about. And then what follows that immediately, that parable of the, uh, of the uh, servant at midnight, are some words of encouragement that all of us would recognize from Luke 11, verse 9. I say to you, he says, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Don't our minds fill with that slideshow of, of those verbs? They're so alive. The asking, the seeking, the knocking. He goes right on in the 10th verse. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Now my New American Standard Bible, that I've used for the last 45 years, has a footnote. And when you go down and you read the footnote that goes along with it, it says that the verbs are in the imperfect tense. Now what that means is the action is continuing. And so this is to be understand, understood as keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and we'll keep on receiving, we'll keep on finding, we'll keep on opening those doors of opportunity for whatever is necessary in living the Christian life. That's what we're being told. We can live like that from now until the future, until the future comes to a close at the end of time. This is how we should live. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount that way, didn't he? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek. They're going to inherit the earth. That's what he says. And blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. All these are words of encouragement from Jesus, and they're directly to you and me while we wait. St. Paul picked up on this. He wrote in his first letter to the Thessalonian church, first chapter, uh, about the good news. This gospel gives us courage to wait on the Lord's return with confidence and stability. He wraps up his letter to the Corinthians in the 15th chapter. Dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know your labors in the Lord are not in vain. Our labors in the Lord are not in vain because they're done in faith. And faithfulness is the measure of success in the kingdom of heaven. James, the brother of Jesus, he writes to the early church in chapter 5, Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Like the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. The Lord is coming, is near. The judge is at the door. That's James. Since the first century, we've been encouraged to persist in prayer. Repent and believe the good news until the Lord comes. During all of these last days, we are to be doing God's will, and we do that by faith, as Jesus recognized God's will. He recognized God's will very easily. Places like Isaiah, you find it in his stories and in his parables and his teaching. Isaiah chapter 1 begins telling us this is God's will from God, God's own mouth, you might say, 700 years before Jesus. I like Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. This is God's will. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. You see, that's always God's will. That's what Jesus meant when he taught them to pray at that very time. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
in Jesus we will see justice being done. And we will be able to answer his rhetorical question. Yes. Yes. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yes. In our works, in our faith, by faith. Yes. We'll cry out like the persistent widow. And we will not lose heart. Repent and believe the gospel. That, my friends, is the good news for this day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let us not become weary and faint in our ministry of persistent prayer. Help us lift up those in need as those and those who hurt. And, and grant us, Father, the spiritual strength to endure our times in the kind of faithfulness that gets respect in your eyes. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now it's time for our benediction, so why don't you be standing? Following the benediction, we'll have... Uh, a choral response from the choir. So let us go forth now with this good news about persistent prayer. In the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>